So today's readings come from 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 to 20, and 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 5. I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he unites himself with a prostitute, is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies sorry, <coughs> are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. Now for the matters you wrote about. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfil his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This is the word of the Lord. So let's pray. Lord, have mercy. Would you speak to each of us, Lord? You know exactly what we need to hear from you. You know exactly the tone of voice that we need to hear it in. You know what we need to be set free from. You know the lies in culture that have perhaps smothered us. And even more deeply, you know every trauma that has been faced in this room. And Lord, we don't hold any of those things lightly, but we do hold you very seriously. And so would you give us the grace to understand what you're saying to us in this moment right now? And would you start journeys of healing for many, I pray. And where we're convicted, Lord, would we not get angry at that? but will we see you at work in us? So for your glory we pray. Amen. Okay, so I think with any controversial topic, we need to think about the questions behind why it's controversial. And these are they, we should have two. See how boring I can make a talk on sex? Let's get into the nitty-gritty strategic behind. The role of the Bible in our faith and actions versus other factors, e.g. cultural. So why does something written over the course of quite a long time, quite a long time ago, have anything to say to us today? And the second is, what's private and when does it affect society? Should we even be having these conversations? Because the dominant narrative in society right now is as long as you're happy with it and you're all consenting adults, then what the heck does it matter? How does this affect anybody else what I get up to? And if we can't address these two questions before we talk about anything else, 
then we're probably in an even more of a minefield. So let's talk about those, starting with what it's like to consider the word of the Bible. Here's my uh, first century house, something like that. Let's try and get into the mindset of a first century person in Jesus' time, or even before, because we've got about 500 or 600 years of scripture before that. Okay, everybody stand off if you're able. Don't worry, this isn't going to be awkward in what you think it is. Don't know what you're thinking it is, but it's not going to be awkward anyway. Right, you are the population of the ancient Near East, okay? Now, sadly, unfortunately, I have to kill off 39.8% of you instantly. You, so, right, accountants in the room, help me out with 39.8%. That's a third. Uh, everyone on that side, sit down, and the back half of that, sit down. So that a third, and the front two, all the back hall, and worship team, that'll do. Right, and front two, front two rows, maybe, of that bit as well. That's about our four, is that about it? Right, unfortunately, that was the infant mortality rate. So unfortunately, that age group did not make it past either in utero or into any stage of past age one of childhood. Okay, now I need another 10% that didn't get past the age of 10. Let's take off the entire three back rows um, there up to um, Caroline's row. Sit down. And up to Caroline, yes, yeah, so Gray and Moore, yep, sit down, sit down. Our population field is diminishing. Okay, now it's going to be a bit sad. In fact, I'm not sure I can think of anyone remaining standing, really. If you are between 35 and 65 in this group, who does that actually leave standing? <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it not an age bracket. I'm going to do it another half. I'm going to do another half, another, the average age and lifespan, if you add it all together, including the infant mortality, so it was very, very skewed, you would end up with an average life age of 35. So that's me on my last legs. Let's take off a good third of the remaining standing. Let's just all that back order, sit down. Right. Now let's imagine that in this group surviving here, we have some fertile male and females. <laughs> Let's imagine, given the average age, I'm not going to ask you anymore. This is the remaining age group, okay, that the tribes of Israel, people who were writing the Bible, had left to work with when it came to the survival of their race. Okay, everybody still standing, please sit down. Does that give you a bit of a visual idea about what it was like in that world? If you didn't promote constantly the idea of a stable married family as you could possibly get, if you didn't promote constantly the idea of children and family being at the centre of that, what would happen? Your race would die out. There's really significant cultural factors as well behind the world that we read, and I'm not ignorant of those, because those questions still come up today. Well, why should a world that was written here, why should that really affect where we are 2,000 years or more later. If we don't have this situation anymore, we're not in a population crisis, we're not left with a third. In fact, we've probably got a population crisis the other way. So why should we take these heterosexual values of making sure we can just continue our race with this very small and desperate number of people left in our world? Why should those values continue today? Well, this is a very hot topic at the moment. Because we're asking, what is the whole trajectory of the Bible? We're asking, where is scripture going from the start to the end? We're asking, how did the early Christians and Jews do things differently from the world around them? And the comparison that we often draw at this stage is with how the Bible talks about women, women in ministry. Yes, I am one, so clearly I have views on it. But if you look at the culture that it was had there, the way that the Bible treats women, although there are some controversial passages, it's actually taking you on a trajectory very different from the Roman culture around it. So the Roman culture around it would not have allowed women to do half the things that appear in Scripture. And indeed, the Jewish culture that Christianity was born out of, that also wouldn't have allowed the things that we saw Jesus let women do. So, for example, his praise for Mary sitting at his feet and learning. 
the women being the first witnesses at the tomb. Women clearly being evangelists in here. And so when we look with our eyes at scripture from 2022 and say, well, does that apply to us? What's in context? We look at it and say, they were trying to do something very different as an early Christian community from the Roman world around them and from the Jewish world around them. Some things they kept up, some things they said, this is us for our time. We're doing things in a different way. However, when it comes to matters of sexuality, they actually took a much stricter line than the culture around them. So yes, the Roman world had family and marriage and all of those sorts of things, but the Roman world was also famous for its brothels and a lot of promiscuity and a lot of temple cults and a lot of in, well, very, very dodgy relationships between teachers and pupils. It was a very corrupt world to Jewish eyes and they wanted to do something very, very different. So the narrative of scripture then, when it came to the Christian church, they copied those ideas from Judaism and indeed made them even stronger and also slightly different. But the trajectory of scripture wasn't, okay, now we've come into Christianity, we're doing something new and even more liberal and we're taking these things a different step and isn't this wide open now that we've got Jesus? They actually narrowed down sexuality, if anything. They spoke about it in almost a stricter way. What did Jesus have to say when it came to the commandment of adultery? It wasn't just that you committed it, it was that you looked at a woman lustfully. So that's why it's important not just to consider scripture for its context, but to consider the journey that you go on in it, in that narrative. So Christianity continued the values of things like the nuclear family, the importance of children, the importance of covenant, and our God is a covenant-making God. That's why marriage and its covenants matter so much. But it did something actually very, very different, and it doesn't get talked about enough. Here's um, Paul, looking very surprised at how we treat his word in 2022. <laughs> he had a radical new concept. Really, for the Jewish world, it wasn't a popular idea, and that was celibacy. That was at the start of our reading today. And so if that's you today, for whatever reason, then I am sorry on behalf of the church for the fact that we have so often promoted marriage and family, and not actually what Paul had to say. And also, I'm sorry, though I don't own it, on behalf of culture for telling you that you are not a whole and complete person unless you're having sex. Because Paul drove this home to people in so many ways. Every single time he's actually talking about it, he's talking to Christians as if the world is about to end very shortly. Now, obviously, that didn't happen. But what is he saying? He's saying, don't focus on the things of the world. Don't focus on the immediate. Don't focus on what they're telling you. Live for a better and a greater reality than this world has to offer. He also talked about it in terms of what is a whole life? And if you want to know what a whole life is, then look to Jesus. I mean, fundamentally, that's the answer to everything. Look to Jesus. But he didn't have sex, and he was the most complete, whole human being on this planet. That is a scary fact that we often forget when it comes to how much the church promotes marriage and sex and talks about it in a good way. So today I want to honour the singles in this congregation, or those who have divorced. You are amazing people in your own right, and you are completely fulfilled and completely whole. And here's another idea that Paul was trying to get to, and this is really one of the main ideas that I want to talk about this morning. Sex is not the chief expression of intimacy that we can know in this world. The world would very much tell you it is. But we have something slightly different to offer. The closest possible intimacy, the relationship that really we all are yearning for, is not a sexual one, but it's the relationship of the Holy Spirit in us, bringing us fully alive. And I'm not going to say anything about my own life. Probably greatly to my husband's blessing and relief at this particular moment, but the closest thing I will say is this. Sex is a very deep and intimate spiritual, 
physical, mental encounter. But I have had deeper experiences with the Holy Spirit. Because there is a part of you that will never ever be fulfilled until you understand that that is what the Holy Spirit brings to you. That depth of intimacy that we feel in sex is a foreshadowing of the depth of intimacy that we will one day feel in heaven with God, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit for all time. That's the intimacy that we as human beings long for. So, what does it mean to be people who can speak something different to the culture? To say actually that our intimacy, yes, sex is important if we're married, yes, this is something that we do. But actually, it's not where I find my chief joy or my chief pleasure or my chief sense of being known or my chief sense of being worth. It is actually to be found in God. But so many people will go through their whole lives trying so many different things, so many different people, so many different relationships to try and fill that void in their hearts. And does that matter? Well, I think it does, because I think it leads a trail of broken hearts and broken lives in the way. And this brings us on to our second part. It brings us on to privacy. Surely that this is something that we don't need to talk about. I'm afraid that we do. I don't see it as a private thing. Yes, of course, what we get up to in our own bedrooms affects us, but I think it also affects society as a whole. And the longer that we detach marriage and intimacy and a sense of responsibility and it's not about me, but it's about the person that I'm with, as long as we, as long as we detach all of those things, we start to change society. Now, of course, people have always had affairs. People have always had sex outside marriage. Since the dawn of time, this has been a thing. But what happens when you start to get very, very much change in a culture? I think it does affect us. And I think it is affecting us more and more and more as an entire society in the West right now. How? One of the ways in which I see it is an increased sense of loneliness. We might be having more and more sex with more and more different people, but I'm not seeing any sign it's making us less lonely or more fulfilled because we've detached sex from the relationship context it ought to be in. Likewise, what is it doing particularly, almost exclusively, to young girls? The pressure on social media, the hidden cameras, the world of trying to work out how to take down intimate photos and videos of you from the internet, from people who've promised one thing, recorded it, and delivered another, and then what is the evil in that? If we just think that sex is some brief transactional thing that we can get out and that's done, and it doesn't harm anyone and the people involved in it. And yes, these perhaps are extremes, you might say, or you might have said 10 years ago, but they are no longer extremes today. This is a very current and present reality for many of our young people and indeed adults. And lastly, I would say also the rise of pornography. If you continue to say, oh, well, we'll just see what happens, we'll just watch a few things, we'll see it, it gets worse and worse and more extreme and more extreme, what are we doing to society as a whole? Our society is being saturated in sex, more and more violent sex. It is a disgusting industry from the pit of hell, the pornography industry. And I don't care if you disagree with me, I'm not paid to be nice to you, I'm paid to speak truth to you. And yet I realise that in this room there will be people in bondage to pornography and addicted to it. And I'm not going to call anyone out because I cannot imagine a worse thing to do to ever call out people to the front. But if the Holy Spirit is convicting you that it's something that you need to be freed from, he's not embarrassed to do that work. We might be, but he isn't. He's not embarrassed to set you free from it. So there's something about the industry that is changing our lives and it's changing our minds and it's changing how we view the person that we're actually with. Study after study after study is showing that it rewires our brains. It's making people think that body parts are statistically far bigger than an average. It's making people need further and further and further extremes to even get aroused. 
And if the goal of marriage is that you are aroused by the person in front of you, it is causing significant issues within marriage because there's just nothing of now anymore that arouses somebody about the normal human being in front of you, which is what it's supposed to be, and that's how it works. Because your mind has been rewired by the extreme things that people are seeing. So there's only one message when it comes to pornography, and it's zero tolerance, and it is stop. It destroys lives, and it's destroying society, and it's exploitative of the vulnerable. But it's a consequence of us saying that we don't really think, really think, that the place for sex is within a loving and stable covenantal marriage context. Now, interestingly, you might ask the question, well, does it have to be marriage? Is it in scripture? Is there a marriage service in scripture? Well, actually, no. Up to the 1752 Marriage Act in this country, what would actually class as being married? It was a long-term, faithful, exclusive to all others relationship in which the community knew that those two people were married. It was called common law marriage, if anyone has heard of anything like that. Now we've moved on since the 1752 Marriage Act. So what does that mean today? Should we still be looking to get married? And a surprising number of people come and ask me that. In the community, you would be surprised at how many people still come and find a vicar and talk about sex. We talk about it all of the time. And my advice is generally, why wouldn't you want to do what our society currently offers as the highest possible way of expressing your love? I don't actually personally think that there is any condemnation if you've been with one person, stable, exclusive to all others, monogamous relationship, that's actually exactly the covenant that we are looking for. But if we look in today's society, what is the highest value that we can offer? What is the highest way we can say to our friends and family, we're not going to give up on this person. When things get tough, we're not just going to say, oh well, throw, throw them to the four winds. We're going to say, I really want to show the world my commitment to this one person and make my covenant in marriage. It doesn't have to be expensive, we do them here. But that is the covenantal heart that we're looking for. Two people to the exclusion of all others. So what can we say if we're looking for a different way at society? This is what I think has been lost. True intimacy. When we put sex in the context of me, 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 my needs, my wants, my goals, that's what drives the wider pornography industry. But it's also what drives loneliness, because we've never felt the us in the sexual act that we were expecting. Whereas true intimacy is about us. How can we serve one another? How can I serve my husband? How can I serve my wife? How can I look to their needs? And actually, that's what we saw in Scripture today. You know, God didn't have to make sex fantastically fun, but he did. That's amazing. But what does it actually say? It's so pro-sex in here, which is why I love the way that the Bible handles it. It's actually saying husbands and wives come together for the sake of one another. Don't actually deprive yourselves, apart from a short time, but come together to serve the other. To even have language in here about women being able to have a demand on her husband's body is shocking for that 2,000-year world that we were talking about at the start. How would a woman have that? Surely it's the man telling the woman what to do. No, that's why the trajectory of Scripture is so exciting on this issue, because it's saying that our bodies don't belong to ourselves. We belong in marriage to one another. How different is that from the way the world talks about sex? I think it is insanely different, because it stops being about my pleasure and what I get out of it, and it starts being about what happens to us as a couple when we serve the other one, when we're there for the other one. That fact alone, I think, can pretty much change your sex life. But if you want to end on two tips, these are the two most common things I would say. Good sex starts at breakfast. Don't misread that. I made that come out in a really odd way. What I mean by that is that it doesn't, especially for women, 
start when you're just really, like, really, really tired, and it's the end of the day, and you're getting to the point where you're just like, okay, I really want to go to sleep, and then it's like, oh, ping, we're expected to be awake and alert and ready. Actually, what turns women on, generally speaking, and I do hate generalizations of the genders, but let's just be a little bit general because I've only got 30 minutes, <laughs> it starts in a marriage with all the other things you can show for the rest of the day. Has your husband remembered to put the bins out? Key, key tip, has he loved you from breakfast? Has he shown attention to you all through the day? Has he been with you in those deeply awful moments and supporting you when you're crying and when life is difficult? Is he the one that knows you intimately and only him to be safe? Is he your safe space for the whole day? Then that tends to make it better later on. And number two, it's in mind and body and spirit. So many people don't even acknowledge the spiritual angle of sex. It's really there. We shut the door, I think, or very often on the Holy Spirit in our bedrooms and think he can't see behind a closed door or something. He's God. He's everywhere. Actually, involve God in your sex life. That sounds bizarre. But if we are mind, body, and spirit, then surely all of us should be engaged in that. Our bodies clearly are, our minds should be, we should be focused on our partner and no one else. But the reason why sex does so much damage when we're having it outside of a safe and faithful and stable covenant is because our spirits are also involved. And that's really what the first half of our Corinthians passage was talking about. Your whole body, which is that, your whole mind, your whole spirit, should be part of that act. Pray. That is a thing. I used to have a tutor at Ridley that talked about his prayer life before he had sex with his wife. And at that point, I thought it was weird and obscure. And now I realize how important it is to realize that there is a spiritual aspect, that we don't throw God out of the room, but we can welcome him in. But before we go down any deeper lines, I realize again, I have half an hour, so I can't talk about this too much. And I want to end on something very important, which is for all those for whom... This has just felt like being hit by a sledgehammer today. And I'm really sorry that it has. I've told you the reasons why I've wanted to talk about it. I wanted us to speak something different into the cultural narrative. But probably, for at least half the room, it's not been an easy story. There have been things that have gone significantly and deeply wrong. You have done the right thing in Christian eyes. You have done everything that you could have done and someone has still hurt you, betrayed you, someone else that you love and know has perhaps been in bondage to pornography and you're seeing your marriage perhaps destroyed by it. I don't know. Perhaps you desperately wanted to be married and you haven't been. Jesus loves you. Jesus is here for you. Jesus wants to come alongside you and lift you out of these things, support you in them, love you really, really well, where you have been betrayed, where you have been hurt. And these things, because sex is mind, body, and spirit, these things have affected you deeply in your mind, in your body, and in your spirit. And I don't want any person to walk out of here feeling judgment, conviction perhaps, yes, but judgment, never. That does not come from the heart of God. And life is not easy. And sometimes in quick sermons and even in quick Bible verses, because again, these were letters that Paul wrote back to the church and dealing with particular issues there, it can be very easy at speed to wash over your particular circumstance and think, well, no one's speaking to me. But Jesus is. And Jesus sees. And the Holy Spirit still can heal you and bring your life back together from the pieces that sometimes particularly sexual situations have put you in. So we're going to leave a fairly long time now to pray and just to sit in the quiet and to allow the words that have upset us and offended us and for that I'm sorry it's never ever my intention to set out to offend anyone but if there's been conviction let's let that settle with us because God can break things in an instant 
that if there's real hurt that we need to process and the way the church hasn't handled things well or the way that we as individuals haven't handled things well or the hurt that's been done to us. Let's love our brother and sister well in this moment and let's all shut our eyes and let's just all allow what needs to settle with us to settle and what needs to go to go and I'll pray at the start and then we'll have some silence and I'll pray at the end. So let's pray. Lord, you are a covenant making, covenant promising God. All of scripture wraps up with a wedding, with you meeting your bride, the church, Jesus. And yet we realize how short this world falls sometimes. And we acknowledge our hurts. We acknowledge our very real pain of how others have betrayed us, our minds, our bodies, our spirits. And we offer you that pain now. And ask you to start a work in us in healing it. And Lord, for those who also need conviction right now, it's not a public thing, it's a private thing. Those who are not living in the way that you've commanded us to live. Those who need freedom from bondage. Lord, would you begin that work as well? as we just sit and wait on you. Would you speak to our very spirits and begin that journey? So we wait on you, Lord.